Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great research being done by folks using the historical collections in the Hagley Library, especially scholars who have received support from the Hagley Center. One such researcher joining me today is Dr. Gavin Benke, Senior Lecturer at Boston University, and we will be discussing his book project titled Imagining the Future of Business, 1961 to 1994. Gavin, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Let's start by painting with broad strokes. What are you researching and writing about? So I'm looking at um, a group of people I broadly call uh, corporate futurists. So these were business journalists, corporate consultants, um, economists, lobbyists, people who worked um, inside corporations like GE and so on. They all sort of knew each other and crossed paths and cited each other's work all throughout the 60s and 70s and a little bit in the 80s and 90s. Um, they all identify to some degree as futurists. But what's interesting to me about them is that um, they really thought, thought a, a lot about the future, obviously, but the specific place they thought corporations would have in that future, um, what sort of role the corporation would play in society at large. And they weighed in on policy debates throughout um, the decades. They had contacts in presidential administrations. They had contacts inside corporations. Um, so they're, they're definitely a part of business discourse in the uh, 70s in particular, but in, starting in the late 60s and moving forward. So I think they're a really interesting way to look at business history during these years. Could you perhaps give us an example of one of these sure. business or corporate futurists? Sure. So um, one, they're all pretty fascinating, but one in particular um, I found through the Hagley um, is a guy named Carl Madden. He was the chief economist for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So I came across going through uh, those collections. Um, and I was aware of him before by reading, say, Ben Waterhouse's book, Living in America, which deals with the chamber. So he comes up in that book. So I just sort of assumed he was part of the chamber's milieu. But what was interesting to me is that he was the member of a a member of the group inside the Chamber of Commerce called the Council on Trends and Perspectives. And this is basically a group of futurists who um, wrote about the future of business, about the role of the corporation, all throughout the 60s and 70s. And I hadn't heard of them before. And um, they have sort of a different interpretation sometimes of events that you'd expect from the Chamber of Commerce at this moment when it's becoming more sort of more politically motivated in sort of a right word fashion. So this group is sort of percolating inside the Chamber of Commerce around the exact same time, say Lewis Powell's uh, infamous memo is circulating at the same time. What so memo I is that? Was, well, I'm sorry? What memo is that? Was, uh, the Powell memo sort of the, is, is what it's now known as, but um, the, the headline of course is the attack on business. And it's this sort of, from 1971, this sort of hard we need to push back on the left, we need to push back on regulation. This is how the chamber should respond. And it's sort of seen as a foundational document in this sort of like hyper politicization of organizations like the chamber and business interests um, during that decade. And it was fascinating to see this other discourse led by Carl Madden um, exist alongside these other sort of more well-known uh, documents circulating around uh, the Chamber of Commerce. So I think that's what's kind of interesting about futurists like Carl Madden is that um, they don't necessarily, I mean, they belong to organizations like the Chamber that we have a certain view of, but then what they're writing about and what they're thinking about is completely different. And part of it's that connection to futurism. Well, so. what, what, what was their vision for the future of uh, American business in the corporate form? So they, um, they were interpreting really uh, the events of the late 60s, certainly the social movement, social upheaval, the environmental movement. Um, abroad, they were looking at decolonization and nationalization of industries. And they basically determined by picking up on a much sort of broader um, futurist discourse that had been 
uh, going for a couple of decades since the end of World War II, imagine that the world had reached a big, big turning point. And this is a really historical moment. And that, I mean, like akin to the industrial revolution, they really thought there was this big momentous change taking place hmm. and thought about, okay, well, what is the role of business gonna be in this new world? They thought one, uh, the public was, demand, was gonna demand more from business in terms of its social role, what it could provide to um, what they call quality of life. Um, but also they began to sort of invest multinational corporations in particular with this kind of utopian way of thinking. They thought these are post-national corporations, the nation state is becoming outmoded. These will bring people together. Um, they're quicker than nation states. They don't have this sort of jingoistic, um, like ugly nationalism that you might find in nation states. So they really kind of thought um, that the world was, was headed for someplace ultimately good, although it was a turbulent period. And they thought that corporations were gonna play a really, really big role in that future. And they advocated for that um, throughout, throughout the 70s. That is quite a contrasting view with say the Chicago school uh, economists view, which was gaining ground as you were saying at the more sort of rightward turn. What is yeah. the connection here with futurism more generally uh, and particularly as an intellectual tradition at this point? So uh, futurism um, had been a well-established intellectual um, movement at this point. Uh, Jenny Anderson has a wonderful book on it, uh, The Future of the World. That brand of futurism really was sort of an outgrowth of uh, the military industrial complex, at least in the United States, where you had these think tanks um, trying to sort of game out um, different sort of scenarios with the, the ultimate goal of trying to avoid nuclear war. So there's this idea that you really need to be way more forward thinking. And so they developed all these sort of different gaming models and predictive methods and things like that. So there's like a methodology that's percolating. Um, there's sort of, there are institutions that are percolating um, around this time, but it's much more focused on sort of like national policy, military sort of issues. Um, at the same time, Daniel Bell um, in Cambridge was spearheading a group um, led for the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences called the Commission on the Year 2000. And he was bringing just lots of different people together, um, thinking about how we sort of plan for the next sort of couple of decades and so on. So there's all these different movements um, coming like around the, uh, you know, sort of coming to a head um, in the 60s. And these corporate futurists were definitely aware of that and picking up on it. Um, and in some case, the cases, the connections are really, really direct. Um, Herman Kahn, who comes out of uh, the Rand Institute, which is of course set up by the Air Force, ends up doing uh, work for Daniel Bell's commission on the year 2000 and produces a book, the year 2000, that all these corporate futurists cite. So um, there's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of material being generated by this broader futurist movement that these people are sort of adopting and bringing in. Hmm. Beyond that, um, there's an institution that's founded in 65 by a journalist called the World Future Society, which still exists today, but in a much more pared down form. And his idea was he was just gonna sort of get a bunch of people together thinking about the future with the ultimate aim of avoiding nuclear war, which seems to be like the big preoccupation with a lot of these early futurists. Um, that seems to have become a meeting place for all these corporate futurists. They all drifted into the World Futurist Society at some point. Um, they all wrote for its magazine, The Futurist. They all attended its conferences. Carl Madden actually does sort of double back to him. When he died, um, his obit um, at the very bottom is the family says in lieu of flowers, they'll, they'd rather have donations to the World Futurist Society. Mm -hmm. So, um, once that sort of larger futures discourse is established, these, these various sort of corporate minded or business oriented people start sort of drifting into its orbit, sort of taking those ideas and then going back to uh, the business world a little bit. Well, it sounds a little bit like their vision is um, quite a continuation and even an elaboration of that post-war liberal consensus where big business, big labor, and big government can all work together to build a better world. I, am I reading that correctly? 
I think in some ways it may it may start there, but um, eventually I think there's a hostility towards big government in some places. Um, I think it um, I think it becomes much more about um, the corporation is the ideal form. Mm. And when futurist rhetoric and discourse gets used in policy debates, it's definitely used in a, in a contrast to, or to sort of push back against government regulation, or in some, in some cases push back against like trade bills that labor unions supported. So increasingly it does, it seems like it might come out of that big sort of liberal consensus of the post-war, um, but increasingly it sort of takes on its own cast. Hmm. Um, and it is, though, I think, fairly related to um, an emerging discourse all around so corporate social responsibility around mm -hmm. the same time as well. Mm. So. so that um, if uh, corporations can be sufficiently socially responsible, they can replace the need for government. Is that sort I, of the argument? I, I think, yeah, some of the I think some of the argument goes um, they're better suited to this new world that we see sort of. Um, emerging than government ever would be. Well, what what transformation were they seeing uh, exactly? What was the new world that the corporate futurists saw emerging around them, perhaps particularly in this 1970s period? So they saw um, changing social values, particularly around environmentalism, um, particularly around what they call sort of quality of life issues. Mm. Uh, there was a sense that corporations needed to build a new social contract. The idea of just sort of producing goods for a consumer society and contributing to that sort of post-war abundance, um, that that goal had been achieved and now it was time to work on something else and people wanted something else. And so it wasn't simply about providing goods, it was about providing, um, providing sort of a, a sense of meaning in people's lives. So, they thought that was happening. They were looking at younger, uh, the younger, the sort of next generation of would-be corporate executives, um, you know, looking at um, undergrads from elite, you know, colleges, and then looking at the protest movements and really worrying and saying, our next generation of top level corporate executives don't seem to want to come here. And there's a huge panic about that. And so there's a sense of how do we reform the corporation internally so the people who are going to Woodstock, listening to, you know, Beatles records, um, smoking pot and protesting the war, how can we get them to come here um, and work for us? Because if they don't, what's going to happen next? Huh? Yeah. Well, so, if that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, if that's the change they see coming down the pike, what is what are their recommendations for corporations handling it? So one of a big thing they want to do is sort of think about um, how they're structured internally. So there's a lot of discussion, and I know this maps on to other sort of bits of business writing that go back even further. Um, but they're talking a lot, a lot about sort of autonomy at work, that you can't have rigid bureaucracies, that people need sort of freedom to experiment, but also that the employees should find the work um, meaningful on some level. It's, it's akin to... Um, if you read the newspapers now when they talk about, um, you know, millennials uh, are gonna reject corporate work unless the, the, the companies they work for have some sort of social vision. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a little, it's the discourse in the seventies uh, around these corporate futurists sounds a little bit like that as well. Um, that's oh, yeah. oh, please go ahead. I was gonna say that's domestically what's going on. Internationally, they're looking at decolonization, they're looking at the way in which some of these um, newly independent governments are nationalizing industries. And so there's a lot of writing around what they call virulent nationalism. So they're really worried about it. But of course, it's a little self-interested because these are, you know, multinational corporations and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so they're, you know, they're trying to sort of make the connection between what they're seeing domestically in the U.S. in particular and what sort of what they see sort of going on in the world around them. How receptive were uh, corporate managers, perhaps especially boardrooms, to this message? That's a really good question. Um, 
in some ways it's it's hard to it's hard to find those really specific kind of uh, one to one correspondences. Um, certainly, GE um, worked for a while with Ian Wilson. Worked there. Um, he a lot of his reports came up in um, in Hagley uh, research. So he was around um, quite a bit, and he seems to have definitely had um, the ear of top level executives at GE. Whether or not his stuff was enacted on, who knows. Mm. Um, but he also actually, the reports he produced for GE became sort of foundational texts for later sort of future studies as well. Um, Herman Kahn was um, sort of like a star speaker at um, National Association of Manufacturer Meetings. In fact, I found again at the Hagley um, discussions of how popular people had found his, um, found his talks. Hmm. So they, they they were definitely around. I don't, but I haven't yet found somebody specifically taking those recommendations and sort of moving it forward. I did talk to. Um, I was lucky enough to to conduct an oral history interview with um, one of these corporate futurists. A lot of them aren't around anymore. Um, and he was saying in the in the in 1980 he produced a really big study for General Motors and they took it seriously and they actually thought about trying to implement some of it, but ultimately they weren't able to, um, some of his ideas, so they just sort of abandoned and, and, and moved on. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in terms of corporations sort of accessing them, it's more of a spotty record. Politicians seem to have really found the futurists incredibly useful. Um, the Nixon administration in particular um, hosted a huge conference in 1972 that brought a whole bunch of these futurists together. Um, in a way that sort of gave cover to um, Nixon's new economic policy and um, as a way to sort of set up or help establish uh, Pete Peterson, who was Nixon's second Commerce Secretary, his sort of agenda for the Commerce Department moving forward. So there was a lot of the politicians, I think, found them really, really useful. What was useful um, to the politicians? I, um, I think you could... Um, you could take some of what these these guys were writing and, you know, basically say, oh, look, these these disinterested intellectuals are saying this. This fits this sort of narrative that I'm already trying to sort of present to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the Nixon administration in particular seemed to have lots of contacts with them. And I suppose uh, political leadership is um, always thinking or, or, or always trying to manage the future anyway. Yeah. And so there's, yeah. there's a certain um, a common goal there, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the Nixon administration had set up this, um, this team, which was staffed by some of these uh, corporate futurists called uh, the, National, the National Goals. I'm blanking on the specific name, but basically it was almost like a big planning organization. They do is to sort of plan out the economy, um, the role of business, all sorts of things moving forward. Um, National Goals research staff. Uh, is what it was called. Um, you know, it didn't work really. They produced one report and then disbanded and it was sort of considered a failure. But yeah, absolutely. Um, there is sort of common cause between what politicians are trying to do and, and what some of these corporate futurists were thinking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, you've mentioned a couple already, but I'd be interested to hear more about the collections at the Hagley Library that you used to tell sure. the story. Sure. Um, so, in 2019, um, I was lucky enough to come to the Hagley on Exploratory Grant, and there I, I mainly went through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, records and the National Association of Manufacturer Records, which were really, really great. Um, and they provided lots of sort of breadcrumbs for returning, and I was um, back there last month. Um, in addition to sort of cleaning up um, some of, you know, some finds there, um, the uh, National Industrial Conference Board records were really great. So that was an organization that kept sort of coming up these different conferences, always co-sponsored with the National Industrial Conference Board or later Conference Board and so on. So, um, and luckily enough, most of the records of the Hagley or a lot of the records of the Hagley are actually transcripts of conferences. So you'd have these meetings, it's the, some of the actors I'm, I'm interested in and there it is just, you know, typed out, 
every single pause and um and ah and everything sort of going for these one day conferences. That was fabulous. Um, beyond that, uh, not as part of its archival collections, but Hagley's library holdings had a number of conference board reports that built on the work of these futurists, cited the futurists, and some sometimes even include, authored in part by futurists themselves. So that was really um, huge. Um, beyond that, uh, the James uh, Bong, uh, Bogman um, papers, I'm mangling the last name right now, um, but he did work for GE. And as part of the collection there, um, there's a whole bunch of documents that Ian Wilson, who's this GE futurist, produced. So that was actually a really, really great treasure trove as well. There are other uh, collections. The McCoy papers um, that I've gone through have uh, lots of different, has a series of meetings in which some of these futurists were showing up, but also some of these Nixon administrations around the time they were in dialogue with futurists were showing up too. So that's sort of another sort of subset of records I've been looking at. So the Hagley has been incredible um, for helping with this project. Yeah, there are just a wealth of records here and the thrill of the hunt in archival yeah. research is just undeniable. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now, most of the firms you've mentioned have been um, these really big, uh, uh, big firms like GE, GM. Um, was this corporate futurism really a creature of the very large corporations, the big, um, uh, the big national leaders, as it were, or um, was this also um, being thought about by smaller firms or perhaps more widely in the business community? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think if the the organizations were large enough, they might actually house some in-house futurists. Um, Royal Dutch Shell um, has like the one like very clear success with this. They had a couple of futurists who um, seem to have accurately predicted the oil crisis and so managed to avoid it. Beyond that though, um, most of these futurists spent their careers at consulting firms. So um, Stanford Research Institute was a huge one. Um, that produced a number of reports and sort of helped develop a number of these people. Another one, um, Institute for the Future, um, which the National Industrial Conference Board actually sort of helped set up. Um, their records are not at the Hagley, um, but uh, they were another sort of one that was really, really active. So um, Herman Kahn uh, eventually left Rand and formed the Hudson Institute. So there's sort of like entrepreneurial consulting activity around these larger corporations. And I think that's almost more where you see these futurists active. In fact, the person who I interviewed who produced that report for GM was not a GM employee. Um, at that point, he was um, he's, he ended up at George Washington University, but I think when he did that report, he was American University. But anyway, the point is he was in a business school, mm -hmm. um, a faculty member there. So um, some of them were inside corporations like Ian Wilson at GE, a lot of the people I'm looking at though were, were consulting for corporations, but acting more independently. Mm -hmm. Well, what was the trajectory of this profession uh, further into time? I, th I think um, your timeline ends in the 1990s. So, so how does your narrative sort of arc toward its conclusion? So um, I'm still trying to sort of figure out what happened during the 80s. Um, a few of the people who I've talked to sort of said Reagan's election was sort of a shock. They seem to have fallen out of favor. Um, they, they all sort of got quiet a little bit during the 80s. Hmm. Um, so really their heyday is that was- because, the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is that because things did go as they expected, as you say? Um, uh, perhaps the Reagan revolution was a shock, perhaps also um, uh, the ultimate rise and then success of the- um, well, supply side uh, view of the economy? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think their vision really sort of lost favor. Mm -hmm. um, of course, this is a matter of degree. In fact, um, Reagan did photo ops with people like Herman. There were certain futurists who were well into the, the uh, Reagan revolution in the Reagan years. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally, um, What's interesting about them is during the 70s, there's this robust discourse. They're showing up at policy debates. They're weighing in on 
questions about how to regulate multinational corporations, how to regulate global trade, um, what sort of employment um, policy should be um, in the US in terms of like pursuing full employment and stuff like that. So they're around and they're a part of this debate, but as the 70s wears on and that sort of Chicago school, more neoliberal um, vision kind of takes hold, they just don't, they don't seem to sort of produce as much. That's one. Mm. Um, some of them go in sort of very strange directions. Uh, Willis Harmon, who's another one I'm fascinated by, um, continue to write books, continue to publish, um, but left Stanford Research Institute by the end of the 70s and was working at these much smaller organizations. One was called the World Business Academy. The other was called um, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Um, and he's sort of going off in those directions. Um, the Institute for the Future, um, their reports become sort of more narrowly focused on like specific issues and trend spotting for businesses. So I think in some ways, a degree of accommodating what business wanted, instead of saying, your role has changed, the world is changing, here's our assessment of this massive historical turning point, becomes more of, here's what consumers are gonna want next year, or that kind of thing. So there's kind of a narrowing of, narrowing of that discourse. Um, what's interesting and why I wanna end up in the 90s is uh, after the end of the Cold War and with Clinton's reelection and with sort of this idea of globalization really coming to the fore, um, a lot of them tried to, and with two, the year 2000 really looming, a lot of them thought this is our moment, let's resurrect this vision, um, and there are these big plans um, to produce this um, event or sort of a series of research projects called Global 2000. It was all about sort of resurrecting these ideas, get ready for the World 2000. Um, they thought the timing was right. Um, you know, Clinton, if you think about his sort of like third way style politics, you know, business friendly, socially liberal. There's sort of the environmental movement is moving back into the mainstream with the 20th anniversary of Earth Day and all of that kind of stuff. And of course, just the world seems more unified. So they thought that this was their moment. And so they, they tried to sort of resurrect these ideas and it ultimately just kind of petered out and they all kind of went their separate ways. So the, the arc of the story is really sort of the 60s, the 70s, sort of down a little bit. And then like a little, a little attempt at a a revival in the early 90s, basically. The comeback that didn't quite take. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, that's just a fascinating story. And Gavin, thank you so much for sharing yeah. that with me today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org at H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger.